So then the point of it all is that we need to have this conversation about how to solve Alberta's revenue shortage and we need to uh, figure out the solution to that by finding a solution through the uh, tax system in Alberta. And I won't go too into the details of that either because Mel is going to get into the details, but um, I could say that our tax system falls far short of the tax system of any other province in the country when it comes to its ability to raise revenue. And that's the reason why we have um, fiscal issues, why we have a big deficit today. It's not because we spend way too much on public services. In fact, we're, uh, Mel will put that into perspective to our level of uh, spending in the province. Um, and that means, so all of this means having conversations about how we change our tax system. And the reality in other provinces is that they have um, two things. One, they have a personal income tax system that raises more annual revenue than, our, than ours does, um, which tends to be through more progressive income tax systems than we have. We did make a great step after the last election. The NDP government had promised to scrap the flat income tax that we had that had been brought in under Ralph Klein, uh, and they did that. And that actually did raise more revenue, and, uh, and that helped a little bit. But the changes didn't go nearly far enough to address the, the structural shortage of tax revenue that we have. And there's still definitely room to raise more revenue on the personal income tax um, part of things. And then the other way that other provinces um, raise a lot of revenue is through a sales tax. And uh, if we do a sales tax in Alberta, then it has to be mitigated for the low, uh, lower income Albertans to make sure that they don't bear the brunt of that. It is very important that we do whatever changes we're doing in a fair way. Um, you know, what, it is not our goal, of course, to, to burden people that are already feeling it, uh, feeling it the most. And so we have to find fair ways of doing that. But the reality is every single province in Canada, except for Alberta, raises significant amounts of revenue from a sales tax. So we have to have that discussion and put those options on the table and figure out if we are going to go the sales tax route, what does that look like for Alberta? And uh, ultimately, I think we had Alex Himmelfarb here a few weeks ago uh, for our conference. Alex is the former top civil servant in Canada. And so he's, he's been through a lot of uh, governments, especially at the federal level, and watched a lot of governments at the provincial level. And what he said is, you know, we're having these discussions about these two types of taxes here, and these are the ones that are going to raise you the most revenue. But ultimately, it'll need to be a mix of taxes. So even though we're focusing on these two, there are lots of other things, and we need to figure out what is the right mix to solve this revenue shortage. Um, because we're short a lot of revenue right now, and at the end of the day, it puts our public services at risk. Uh, it puts our healthcare system, our education system, our post-secondary institutions all at risk uh, of facing massive cuts, um, whether it's in a year or two years or, or even further down the road. Eventually, something has to change. So I think I probably said enough about those details because Mel is going to go much more into details, and so I'm going to... Uh, do we have Mel's... Oh, sorry, we're going to show the video first. How, are there, uh, how many of you have seen the video for our campaign already? Okay, so a few others haven't, and that's good, it's good to have a mix of people. So we're going to show you the, it's about a three minute video from the campaign that we launched uh, last month, and uh, yeah, we'll see what you think. For too long, Alberta has allowed its financial house to crumble. We've been asleep while stable revenue sources were chipped away. And we've pressed news on the fact that we didn't even collect enough money to pay for basic things like schools and hospitals anymore. Instead, we've relied on unstable sources of money like resource royalties to pay for essential services. That's like hoping for a lottery win to pay your heating bill, or waiting for dear old Uncle George to bail you out of your student loan. Resource royalties are just plain unreliable when it comes to financing the infrastructure and public services Albertans need. And that means our public services are constantly at risk of falling apart. So how can we rebuild our public finances? Some people will tell you we need to run deficits. Of course, deficit spending is important in difficult times, but it's not sustainable. And if we don't have our financial house in order, those bills will pile up fast. Others claim we need to cut Alberta's public services to balance the books, but that's like paying your credit card bill by turning off your utilities. When we cut our public services, we move Alberta backward, not forward, and we don't get any closer to responsible revenue management. The only way to fix Alberta's public finances for the long term is to increase provincial revenue from reliable sources. There are several different ways to generate revenue, and Albertans need to talk about 
responsible taxation. For instance, a 1% income tax increase on all of the lowest income Albertans means an extra billion dollars in revenue. This would cost the average person an extra $8 a week. Sales tax, a fact of life in every other province, is another option to stabilize our public finances. Each percentage point of sales tax could generate up to $1.6 billion of revenue, helping to pay for hospitals and schools with enough doctors, nurses, and teachers for everyone. And sales tax credits for low-income Albertans means the poorest won't be unfairly targeted. It's time for Albertans to understand that we can't rely on the resource revenue windfall anymore. We need fair, responsible taxation, just like every other province. Alberta needs to fix its revenue shortage now, so we can protect and revitalize our public services. And so future generations aren't stuck with a bigger problem. Cutting services or borrowing money aren't sustainable options. It's time for a grown-up conversation about what mix of taxation Alberta needs to fix our revenue shortage. Join the conversation at revenuereno.ca. All right, what do you guys think? Great. Uh, so I'm going to bring Mel up now and the, our other three guests who many of you know, but I'll introduce them after Mel gets a chance to speak. Uh, and they'll be speaking in a little bit about some specific areas of public services and what the state of those services is now um, and what things um, could potentially look like for the future. Uh, so I've got here Dr. Mel McMillan, who is a Professor Emeritus of Economics from the University of Alberta. And uh, Mel and I both wore uh, matching purple shirts today to match the color of the screen that's in front of us here, <laughs> which was one of our technical dif difficulties. But Mel's got a slideshow. Oh, and the color actually looks pretty good. Uh, so that's terrific. We've figured out our problems. Uh, so without further ado, Mel McMillan. Well, thank you very much, Joel. I've got this in the right place. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate the invitation. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great video. I mean, it just hits a lot of truths uh, in, a, in a very uh, meaning, meaningful way. Uh, I'm going to be a much uh, more, you know, not nearly so exciting or as easy to listen to, but uh, I'll try to, uh, what I want to... near the video. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, I, I won't be very interesting to listen to, and, uh, uh, but uh, uh, we'll try and present some information here which uh, perhaps will substantiate uh, in a little more detail what going, what's going on in the provincial uh, fiscal situation. And understanding what the, what the situation is, and in particular, looking at where, where the province is uh, possibly going to be going, uh, we benefit from the recent budget by the, the, the uh, Minister of uh, Treasury Board and Finance brought down. And there are some interesting uh, things that have come out of that budget, and they're not all obvious. So I'm going to try and present a little bit of uh, insight as to uh, what's there, and also just a little bit of background into a variety of things. Um, the particular feature of, of the latest budget was that it presented a, a plan to balance now. That plan is somewhat aspirational, but at least it provided a bit of a goal as to where the province thinks it would be in 23-24, fiscal 23-24. Uh, uh, it should the, should the provincial government, should the existing government be in, be in uh, power at that time. And uh, what it plans on doing is that it's going to try and control spending, of course. It's, it's going to look at their expects to get increased in natural resource revenues. And then finally, uh, in the meantime, when those two are separated or not, the revenues aren't sufficient, we're going to be going into debt. And uh, all of these things have some con consequences. So uh, let's look at the revenue side because I think that this is primarily a revenue problem that Alberta faces. Oh, great. Now, you may not be able to see this very well. The screen is not too large, but uh, and some some people don't like graphs and so on. So uh, if it uh, you know you can hopefully. 
slowly, just listen to what I have to say, and the message will come through. Okay, the... Saskatchewan, still less than in Ontario and Quebec and Manitoba, but 
much higher than what it is in the other two provinces, whereas relative to GDP, it was indicated it was smaller. This column over here with $20,000 at the top, that's the per capita debt if you take the total accumulated debt in the province. This is the $96 billion that you hear in the, in, in the media and reported in the papers. Uh, so that is a, a, lar a large amount. The debt, the debt as a percentage of GDP uh, is this line here, which looks relatively small. But more relevant is what is the debt compared to government revenue, because it's government revenue that is going to have to pay that debt. And this line here is the net debt relative to government revenue, which you can see has been going down since about 2008, 2009, and has become negative. That is, we actually are accumulating debt after about 2015, and it would reach 100% reach of, of provincial government revenue before, well, about 2020, 21, 2022. And the accumulated debt, that is, before you remove net assets, is this number here, this line here, and that would increase to 150% of government debt. So the debt is large relative to the size of the government in the province. And that debt has to be paid, and that means there's debt service charges. So these debt charges in 2023-24 would amount to almost 6% of government revenue, and that is higher than what it would be in Saskatchewan, BC, and about the same as what it would be in Manitoba. So the size of the debt and the burden that it's putting upon the government is going to be larger than the province is indicating in its uh, figures where it compares debt to GDP. Okay. Growing debt, growing debt service costs mean that there's going to be a squeeze on expenditures. So what is that likely to look like? Well, this is government revenue program expenditure, government expenditures for services as a percentage of household income. So when you're looking at a long term, which this goes from 1989 until 2023-24, when you're looking at a period of time like that, you have to take account of inflation, you have to take account of population growth, and you even have growth in productivity and, and household incomes over that period of time. So what I like to do is to look at expenditures relative to household income, because that takes account of inflation, population growth, and any income growth that would occur. You can see that in Alberta, this has been, for most years, about 20% or a little bit higher than 20%. And here is where we ended up as of March. And in the future, we see this declining. And it's declining from about 21% on average of household income to 18%. Now, 21% is about the same level of spending relative to household income as you find in British Columbia and Ontario, which are low spending provinces. Okay? Other provinces spend about 25% of household income. That is, their program expenditures for service take requires 25% of their household income. So Alberta is low tax, and it's low and comparable to other low tax provinces and low expenditure provinces, such as BC and Ontario. This 18% happens to be the level that 
was achieved in the client cuts. It's a low level that was achieved in the client cuts. So the level of expenditure is going, and services is going to diminish relative to uh, our incomes to the same level that it did, that it reached in the client cuts. Now you can see that the client cuts did not last, or the, that level did not last. I consider them unsustainable cuts. And the expenditures rose quite quickly after 1997-98. And ever since then, it's been over 20%. So we're talking about a cut that is about 15% cut from the long-term average. Now this 15% cut comes from three things. One, holding nominal expenditures to less than the inflation rate and population growth, one of the goals of the province. <coughs> About a third comes from growth in debt servicing costs, that is the interest that we have to pay. And if you're going to hold nominal expenditures fairly constant, you're going to have to uh, take, pay the interest out of that, which means you have less to pay for other services. And about a third comes from a growth in household incomes. So, if you think that is bad, some politicians argue that we should go back to the past and we would have no carbon tax. We would have a 10% corporate income tax again and we would have a 10% flat tax. If you did that, you would go down to 16.7%, which is a 20% cut in, in services from where we are today. Okay? And if you're going to have a 15 or a 20% cut, where are you going to cut? Here's the list of government services, 15% is about the size of the school budgets. 20% is about half of the health care budget. So we have, you know, if you're talking about cutting, where are you going to cut? What are your plans? So maybe you don't like the cuts, then maybe you want to look at the revenue side of the picture. And if you do that, Alberta has what we call the Alberta tax advantage sense that our taxes are lower than they are in other provinces. So what this graph shows you are the billions of dollars that Albertans would pay in taxes if they had the tax system that existed in those provinces. That is, if Alberta had the British Columbia tax system, we would pay $11.2 billion more in taxes than we do today. Okay. And, of course, it's higher in other provinces. So, we have a low tax uh, a fiscal system, but, of course, that tax system is not meeting our needs. Today, we have an $8.8 8 billion dollar deficit, or are planning for that this year. We could cover that $8.8 .8 billion dollar deficit and with tax revenue and still have a 2.4 billion dollar tax advantage. That is, we could cover our deficit and not damage our position as the lowest tax province. Furthermore, using the government's data and assumptions, in 2024, we would have something between a 5.6 and a 6.9 billion dollar tax advantage while maintaining services at the existing level, that is at 21% of household incomes. So the conclusions are is that Alberta has a fiscal problem. It is mostly a revenue problem that results from a collapse of energy prices. The second conclusion is that servicing the public debt is a new burden, that new requirement on our expenditures that we have not had before, 
and it's going to be additional and it's growing. The plan to balance that the province puts forward implies a 15% reduction in the level of services in the province. Okay? We're going to see services decline approximately 15% okay? if, they, if it follows through as planned. Now, with a comparatively modest tax, suggest a sales tax of 5%, Alberta could maintain services at the existing levels and balance the budget. At least by 2023-24. Uh, by uh, and if Alberta relied less upon natural resource revenues, it could do other things with natural resource revenues. It could build up a contingency fund to help cushion the next um, uh, recession and collapse of resource revenue or collapse of revenues. We could pay down provincial debt faster than planned, and we could add to the Heritage Savings Trust Fund or other types of savings fund. And the final note is that. On Friday, I believe it was, the Auditor General reminded us that Albertans need to do some long-term thinking in terms of their fiscal future. And I think that's a good note to end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mel, for such a huge amount of information in a short amount of time. Uh, you've given us lots to think about on uh, that sort of macro level of things. Um, what we want to do now is get into some of the specifics because of course, especially if we're looking even under the current plan at a 15% reduction in services and I haven't actually seen it, seen it fra uh, framed in quite that much detail. Uh, it's, it's great to have your expertise there Mel to show us um, what that looks like. So we want to talk about some specific areas of public services and uh, so what the situation is like now, and I think we'll find that in many areas our resources are already stretched fairly thin. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if we're going to go even further in that direction, that of course has very serious consequences for us. Um, and we want to get a sense from some of our folks that work on the front lines or help to manage things that are going on in the front lines here. And so I want to introduce uh, to you, I don't have long biographies for them, um, but they'll, they'll tell you a lot about the kinds of things that they work on from day to day. Uh, I've got, uh, to my immediate left here, Margaret Brown with the Alberta College of Social Workers. I've got uh, Bridget Sterling over beside Mel, uh, the Vice Chair of the Edmonton Public School Board and Trustee on the Public School Board, as well as Mike Parker, the President of the Health Sciences Association of Alberta. So Margaret and Bridget and Mike are uh, each going to give us um, a little bit of a sense of what things are like in their worlds. And we actually didn't decide on an, on an order yet. Who wants to go? Mike wants to go first? I guess I do. Okay. I was looking for rock I know you're doing rock, paper, scissors, but I just saw your hand move first, so I'm going to go with you, Mike. Yeah, then I just get it. Sure. Sure. So Mike, if you want to, oh yeah, do we want to come just down here? Yeah, sure. Good evening, folks, and uh, thanks, Joel, for, for bringing us out tonight. Uh, it was interesting as this talk was going on and unfolding, the, the comment on the 90s and climb sure, sure uh, rang in my ear. Uh, looking out in the audience, and I can see a few that might have been around in the 90s as well. Uh, I was uh, a young man, just 20 some years old, then, and my folks were both public sector workers, and the direction from them growing up was get a public sector job. Get a health care job, they said, you'll always have one. Well, in the 90s, when Klein was done, the hospital in my town was closed. My parents were both out of work and they lost their home. And that's what it looked like uh, as I moved into the work world. Let's fast forward 20 years and where are we at today? Well, those cuts we're still feeling. That town still doesn't have a hospital. The hospital in Calgary that we all got to watch getting blown down on the TV way back in those days. I think some of you might have even seen, you know, remember seeing that. Some of the conversations today that we're hearing is this 20% uh, this cut that Mel was talking about. This 20% is going to fix all these problems. And yeah, for, for the folks that I represent in healthcare, 20% is half the budget. Well, we've been talking about cutting the fat, cutting the fat for years and years. Well, I'll be honest, uh, 
hearing from the front, uh, front lines of healthcare, the fat that's left out there isn't fat anymore, it's just the bone. That's all that we've got in healthcare anymore. Our folks are stretched to the limits. They don't replace workers that retire or quit. So the same amount of work, our population in this province didn't drop by 20%. Our population stayed the same, actually. It's gone up a little bit. I don't have those numbers, Joe, maybe you do. But our population continues to grow in Alberta, so that workload is still there, yet we're not replacing our workers. So we're already seeing this, this slow whittling of, of our front lines of healthcare, but the workload still remains. So who's doing it? Well, our folks are working a little bit extra, a little bit extra. The boil the frog program is going on with our workers on the front lines to just get a little bit more out of them every year. Uh, recently signed collective agreements uh, says that uh, we're going to try and do our part in, in managing some of this revenue issue that we have in this province. Double zeros doesn't help anybody, and I hear about it daily. We've got uh, crumbling hospitals within this province. You look at the Misericordia in Edmonton, the Royal Alex in Edmonton, specifically around here. And these places have billions of dollars worth of repairs that are required just to maintain where they are. And these are unpaid bills from 20 years of cutting the fat and trying to manage this problem. So this is where, this is where I'm sitting. Uh, and it's all across this problem still. From years of, of, of these cutbacks, our hospitals are suffering from lax of maintenance, the cracked walls, uh, scheduling surgeries based on weather. When did that become something that we do? Sorry, you can't, you can't do your surgery because the roof might leak, so we got to wait until next week. These are conversations that are actually going on out there, coming in from our front lines. Uh, we don't have enough money to can even cover the facilities for our elderly. We're missing 2,000 beds for our elderly. So in that backup, the elderly can't be taken out of uh, long-term care into, into palliative. The long-term care is backed up into acute care. The acute care is backed up into your bedroom and your living room. And now you can't get an ambulance. So this is the chain that's going all across this province is that they are stretched to the point where we just don't have the resources to maintain health care that we expect every day in this province. What's the next step? I don't know. Again, if there is a change in government, the 20% cut that I have to face with my membership, you tell me where it's going to come from. It's the front lines. There is no more fat left in this system. How about that for an opening statement? Joel, is that the... You want me to go on a bit further there? <laughs> we can go on to a bit and we can... I mean, we'll have... Uh discussion afterwards too. So we that sounds good. Why don't we, why don't we move down the line a little bit, maybe? Sure. Bridget. Go ahead, Bridget. <clears throat> sure. So you want us to talk right now, Joel, just sort of about where things are at right at the moment? I think about the about the whole situation right now. The whole situation right now. Yeah. Perfect. So what I want to talk about a little bit, um, so I'm, I'm both the vice chair of the public school board and I'm also a PhD. Sorry, I'm also a, a, I'm both the vice chair of the public school board and uh, a PhD student at the U of A, and my, my area of interest was primarily around children's rights, and um, I think a lot about childhood in future. And I think one of the things that we're doing right now is um, we have a lot of conversations about how children are going to pay off this debt in the future, and we forget that right now actually our children are paying off the debt from the past. They're just paying it in a very different way than we might think about. Uh, so one of the things I do as a school board trustee is I spend a lot of time talking to parents and community members and people out there, and I get a lot of questions that come up. Why is my child's class size so large? Um, can we get rid of our school lunch fees? I, I don't understand why I have to pay fees for my child to eat lunch at school. Um, we need an EA in our classroom because we've got kids with special needs and we don't have enough support for them. Um, why has my school been painted in years? Why does this place look so bad? You know, I, I have to answer these questions. And I, I don't think money will solve everything in education, but there's a lot that we could use it for. Um, education funding's been stabilized under the current government, and we've been able to predict some funding for student enrollment growth. Um, but we are still, to some extent, living on uh, a bit of a funding roller coaster in that we don't have guaranteed predictable funding for education. Uh, and so, We've had some assurances that that funding for growth in student enrollment will continue, but we need to be honest about what that really means. Funding for growth with no increase in per student allocations means slowly that we are seeing a clawback of funding as our school district costs rise because of inflation. It also puts trustees like me in a difficult position as we're facing decisions about hiring, salaries, um, collective agreements, because we're seeing enrollment growth and a need to hire more teachers and staff to support those students. And yet workers, understandably, want to see increases in their wages to, to keep up with inflation too. So we get put in this tight place of trying to figure out how to balance these staffing needs. Um, 
we're also seeing increasingly complex classrooms. Um, in Edmonton Public Schools alone, our English language learning population grew by 27% over the last four years. Uh, our First Nations, Métis, and Inuit student enrollment increased by 10%, and we saw an 8% increase in enrollment for students with special needs. We're also seeing an increased demand for mental health supports, and um, especially as the supports available out in the healthcare system have decreased. And the recent recession has seen more families struggling financially and needing help coping with the practical impacts of poverty, uh, hunger, poverty, uh, kids needing a meal or a warm coat, but also the emotional impact that has for students. And so this means our number of students who need support is climbing, while our funding is not keeping pace with those needs. Um, we've seen some promising programs. I, I'm not going to lie, I'm delighted to see some funding for school nutrition, but it is just not doing enough. And what that means is that schools are doing more and more with less and less, except that once, as we pointed out, once you've done more with less for enough years, eventually you're doing less with less. Uh, and so what that means is, you know, I'm asked at parent meetings, what do you mean, my child, don't we have school counselors anymore? Aren't there school nurses anymore? No, we haven't had those people for years in schools. We don't have teacher librarians who help children with their learning needs, um, help those kids learn to read. And so, one of the ways we've tried to control, you know, spending after years of cutbacks is that those positions are gone. We also don't have as many of the consultants who come in and help teachers deal with complex students in the classroom. Um, and we don't have uh, those psychologists and therapists available as quickly to help students with assessment and support when they have a special need and they need that additional, those additional resources. The last piece I want to say about that is that it also goes for our school buildings. So a lot of people probably have seen the news stories that Edmonton Public Schools is running out of high school space. We will run completely out of space for public high school students in the 2022-2023 school year. We don't get another school built, and that's including the school that's currently under construction in Heritage Valley. So years of delays in school construction had meant that we are running out of physical space. But, so this puts us in a difficult position. Do we hold classes and shifts? Do we give, have kids in school four days a week? Do we offer online learning? Do we lease space? Leasing space is really expensive. Uh, or do families get stuck with difficult choices of, you know, my, I want to send my child to public school, but there's no room. Do I have to decide to send them to a faith-based uh, district that maybe doesn't meet my family's beliefs, but I need to make this decision? Do I then make the decision, the difficult decision, to find money in my own family's budget to pay for private education because there's not enough room in a public school? These are not the situations that we want to put parents in. The other piece is that um, we've seen an a huge legacy of underfunding and infrastructure. Uh, like Mike mentioned, with hospitals, schools are in the same condition. Um, years of provincial debt got tucked away in our infrastructure. Right? Edmonton Public Schools alone has $750 million worth of deferred maintenance right now in our schools. Uh, Calgary Board of Education recently announced that they have a billion dollars. So that's Edmonton's two major uh, public metros alone. That's Alberta's two major public metros alone. Uh, there's billions of dollars in deferred maintenance hidden our, in our schools and in our infrastructure across this province. Um, and that's not to build, to, re to fix that, that's not building fully modern learning environments. That's fixing roofs, replacing boilers, <laughs> the basic needs of keeping those buildings functional, that's foundations. We have schools with foundations right now that we're worried about. So, I just want to say that this is a hidden legacy of debt. When Klein officially paid off the debts on the provincial books, in reality, a lot of that debt got hidden away, got hidden in our public services, got hidden in our infrastructure, and our current school conditions represent that debt plus interest. So I'm going to pass along, and then I think we're going to talk about what we want. Doctor? Yeah. Thanks. Good evening. Thanks again, Joel, for having us all come together. So I lived through the Klein era as well. I was a social worker in this province. It was painful. It created depression amongst public servants that I will never want to see in this province again. I always felt that we had enough resources. It was just what they were doing with them. And over the years, that's the truth. 
Social workers are not the preferred profession that people want to go to. They go to social workers in times of trouble, in times of problems in families, unemployment, marital breakup, criminal addiction, mental health issues. There are 8,000 social workers in the province now. They work in prison systems, in school systems. They work in hospitals, they work in community. We're everywhere, but we're very invisible because it's the troubled times that people come to us. What's happening in our field, and it's both in provincial, where there are H income support workers that are social workers, and there are long lineups for services. I remember taking a client who was homeless to go and get funding. I had a place for him to live at the Y, which is now closed. We were told to come back tomorrow because they'd already had their quota for the day. Homelessness is rampant in our province and in our city. There's lots of plans, there's lots of paper, there's lots of articles, but it's kind of like all the reform policies that get built up and nothing's done with them. There have been some gains, of course, in the last three years. We were very hopeful. The change doesn't come quickly, and there is systems. I look at it as a systemic problem, but as social workers, we take it on our shoulders, somewhat like teachers do, um, and uh, administrators, and we feel it's our personal problem rather than a revenue problem, rather than a justice issue. And social workers, one of our um, mandates is social justice. Um, for all, um, no matter what your background is. Uh, Bridget has mentioned this, poverty is rampant. We have so many double income families and they're stressed out trying to just pay the bills at home. Uh, early childhood education is the key to getting out of poverty, having the appropriate childcare spaces, having good childcare, that you're not afraid that your child is going to be hurt in that setting. And this is what keeps the economy going. Everybody's stressed out, trying to work, trying to make ends meet. Um, and that whole area of who's responsible, you feel you are. And if you don't make it, and if your marriage breaks down, or if your kids are taken into care, you feel like you're the failure. Rather than if we had a society where there was equal um, opportunity and resources. Everyday social workers spend their time between the needs of seniors, children, and families, and individuals, and the resources out there. And we keep trying to wheel and deal. And I feel like a broker all the time, trying to squeeze when there isn't any more to squeeze out. Um, I remember one of my clients, she was a generous, charitable soul, and she didn't have enough bus money to come in. Um, and when she was leaving the clinic, she said, oh, and by the way, I gave away my bus ticket to somebody who needed it more. There's a study that says that people that are in the low income area are much more charitable than those that have a lot. Um, and that, that really brings it true that people in low income are there for circumstances that have very much been out of their control, whether it be health, disability, um, and then what happens is they blame themselves, where the people that are, have a lot think that they're all well deserving of it and they've earned it. And that is not necessarily the case um, because they've been given it by their families and their parents and intergenerational um, uh, resources. So what, uh, it, it, so it sounds kind of dire, but what is it uh, if we do not have a change in revenue? Uh, long wait lists, not enough resources, housing, food insecurity, increasing mental health and addiction challenges, more family breakdown, increased family violence and crime, more children requiring social services, and I can't say enough about seniors because there's, there's this whole demographic and we get blamed for things too, like we use the resources, but seniors in distress and not able to cope, chaos, confusion, and a lack of compassion. So that's the dire straits of social workers that they're facing every day. Uh, thanks. Great, thanks Mark. I have another mic so we can pass this down. Um, Mike, did you have uh, some more that you wanted to add? Sorry, I don't know if you got to all of the questions, if you had a little bit more, or do you want to get into discussion now? Let's, let's discuss. Yeah, okay. We, we, uh, we know we're around here. Sure. So, um, let's open it up to the floor and actually I want to, I want to start 
by talking just a little bit about, uh, sometimes I do this at the end and sometimes I do it part way through, but just about some of the elements of the campaign. Because one of the questions we often get is, well, what, what can we do, especially when we're a relatively small number of people in the room, we're in a city that has a population of a million people or so in our metro area. Um, so what can we actually do when, when it seems like there are, is a small group of people who are motivated, um, but we have a big task in front of us. And so one of the resources we've developed for this campaign is a, a leaflet, a, uh, just a folded, sort of single big page uh, leaflet um, that we've tried to make very, very readable with not, you know, it's not a big essay or anything. It's really supposed to be designed for your average person to be able to have a look at it, to read it within five or ten minutes, um, and to get a good sense of what the problems are and what the potential is for the future. And we have stacks and stacks of these in our office. Um, and we want to send you away today, if you can, um, with as many as you think you can use. So we want you to actually use them, so don't take a big stack if you don't think you can hand them out. But if you can think of 20 people or 50 people, maybe if you're with an organization that you can hand these out to, then please take as many as, uh, as you can. And if we run out, we've got a bunch more at the office and we can get them to you. So I want you to know that that resources is, uh, resource is there. And the website at revenuereno.ca has, of course, the video, uh, but also has a, uh, an action button on the top of it um, that is a tool for you to be able to easily uh, send a message to your MLA that represents you in the legislature. And those elected representatives need to hear from as many people as possible that we care about this issue. Um, because that's the message that we are getting back, those of us in uh, that get to do this kind of thing full time for work when we say to the finance minister when we get consulted that we need you to address this revenue problem because it's such a threat to our public services he's throwing it back to us and saying um, we're not hearing that enough from Albertans and we're not convinced that Albertans actually want to go that way uh, and maybe he's right but we need to change that if he is right uh, we need to make Albertans understand what the consequences would be for our public services that Albertans value so much um, if, if we want to actually see those services protected, Albertans need to understand what the options are and the only way that we can really do that is if we renovate our tax system um, to protect those services for the future. Um, the other resource I wanted to highlight that we have a bunch of copies of too is this document called Priorities for Advancing the Public Interest and Public Interest Alberta's six task forces and our board of directors and many of our uh, partner organizations worked very hard on this and it's got nine different sections of priorities for the province including a healthcare section, section a senior section, an education section, um, a human services and poverty section and several others about what direction the province should go uh, and it's also got a revenue section of course and so you can use that as a resource when we're having these revenue conversations it always has to come back to our public services and to the things that we want that that we need that revenue to pay for. And so this booklet is a really good guide if you need some more detail uh, of what is happening in those areas. Um, so with that, and I'll say a little bit more at the end too about what I think you can do to take action, but let's open it up for some discussion. And I guess we've just got the two mics here, so maybe I'll let Brett run around with the mic uh, to people who want to make a comment or ask a question. And you can send your comment up into the ether and let anybody uh, respond to it if you want, or if you want to direct your uh, question or comment to uh, anybody here to Mel or to any of our other uh, speakers or to me, then feel free to do that. But I'm holding the microphone first here to speak. Fair enough. Fair enough. You know, Joe, I just wanted to say too, it's interesting, you know, I represent, I have the privilege of representing 25,000 healthcare workers on the front lines. And uh, this roller coaster of revenue reform for the last, whatever, 25 years, as Mel put up on the screens there, you can see how they're, how they're trying to survive this. And, and nobody that I work with is telling me that this is a good idea on how to fund health care. You know, they're actually saying this is dangerous. And, and that's the, the clear message coming from the, from the front lines of health care. And I imagine from the front lines of education saying this is going to cost somebody dearly real soon here. So. Um, first of all, I, you know, asking people to pay more taxes is a really hard thing to do. Good. We, they did not ask me to talk to a couple of couples who aren't poor and anyway said to work, who oh, pay more taxes. So we've got to find an edge, some of the information you're giving us this evening, like that schools aren't being repaired, that healthcare is being cut, there's not enough from the seniors, and I'd be glad to get your information so I've got that, you know. But David and I went to, uh, a couple of years ago, 
the Heritage Fund at their annual general meeting. There was about 16 of us turned up and we actually had a very pleasant evening. But I was surprised how much money there is in that Heritage Fund. And we never, nobody ever talks about it. I think the government's allowed to spend 3% of the money they made that year, but they're not dipping into the capital, I believe. But actually, I was quite surprised how much money was in there. Does anybody know how much it is? 16 million. <laughs> Sorry? No, no, yeah. Uh, the, the more important question to ask is how much was in there 10 years ago? And, and I, Mel, do you have the numbers by chance? Well, the... Here. Uh, the Heritage Trust Fund is... Uh, uh, we have not contributed to it, uh, except for one small contribution. We have not contributed to it since, uh, I believe, the end of the 80s. And so, and in fact, we took money out. The earnings of the fund were transferred into the general revenue fund and used to provide, help provide services. Uh, that has recently changed to the extent that they are, and I haven't checked on this recently, but at least they're attempting to uh, maintain the real value of the fund by holding back, retaining in the fund an amount to allow for inflation. But the thing is, the population is growing all the time, so that the fund basically gets eroded in per capita terms, so it becomes smaller and smaller. And even with relatively good, but highly variable returns on investments that are held in the fund, uh, the amounts that go into general revenue are uh, highly variable and then two they become a smaller and smaller portion of the total costs of providing services the total expenditures that we have so the heritage fund which i think right now is about 17 billion dollars uh, that's 40 percent of our expenditures in any one year now we accumulated what we called a sustainability fund of $17 billion, uh, which we had in about 2007, 2008. And uh, that was diminished quite, for quite quickly. By 2015, it was gone because we were spending, and rather than we were running a deficit, and rather than uh, increasing taxes or cutting spending, we uh, drew on our bank balance and we pulled down our bank balance. So our sustainability fund uh, disappeared. And as soon as that disappeared, then we had to go seriously into borrowing. And that's where that borrowing goes, starts to increase very quickly. Okay. So that's probably much more than you wanted. Sorry, just to respond to you, the first part of your comments to Paulette uh, about uh, raising taxes not being popular, which I think doesn't surprise anybody. I think what we need to make clear to Albertans and what we're trying to do here is, uh, is to say that they're, well, first of all, you've heard about the path that we're on, and we know that that can continue forever. You know, running deficits for now is okay, and I said earlier, it's a much better alternative to cutting services, in my view. Um, and I think in all of our views, probably in the room. Um, the only other two uh, paths in front of us that Mel described in a lot of detail are massive cuts to services and more significantly increasing revenue. And so if, if people want to say, I don't want to pay more taxes, well, you can say that, but you have to understand that the alternative is massive cuts to services. And those aren't popular either. Blowing up the hospital wasn't popular. Um, you know, cutting, cutting education funding and whatever the implications of that would be in, in big dollars would not be popular. There aren't any popular options here. Um, but we're going to have to pick one of those two paths. And, uh, and so people need to understand if, if you really care about uh, the future of your own children and, and their education and the health of all Albertans and ensuring that we have access to those services. And I mean, even 
And that's not even getting into the kinds of improvements that we need in uh, universal pharmacare and, and dental care as part of our healthcare system, which has never made a lot of sense to me or I think a lot of the people in the room. If we want to be able to talk about those things, the only way that we can talk about those things, protecting those services and having the ability to actually make improvements is if we have this taxes conversation. So I think that's the biggest thing. When somebody says, Albertans hate paying taxes or I hate paying taxes, um, you have to talk to them about what the alternative is and put those, put those facts on the table. And uh, we can't have it both ways. So we've had it both ways because of those resource revenues, but it can't continue forever. And that resource revenue, uh, it just, it mostly isn't there right now. I think this year, total resource revenues were something like four billion, I think maybe a little bit over four billion dollars. Um, at its peak, we were up over $11 billion, so that's, that's almost the entire deficit there right now as we've seen a 7 to $8 billion drop in resource revenue from 2011, I think was our peak here. There's a question here. Uh, Rachel Motley seems to be obsessed with getting her pipeline to BC built no matter what, even though it appears that it may well be a uh, uh, by the last gas of a dying industry involving the tar sands. So I'm wondering what you think about the advisability of her apparent, apparent willingness to sink billions of dollars of taxpayer money into guaranteeing the, the cost of construction of the pipeline, even though it might well turn into a massive boondoggle, a stranded asset. Anybody want to take that on? <laughs> As a healthcare practitioner, I'm not sure I have the skills, but I can talk about it if you want me to start and maybe pass it back. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated piece, absolutely. I was uh, out in Ontario listening to what Ontario thinks about what we're up to just this last weekend. And, and, and yeah, it, it's an interesting question. Why couldn't we send it east? Why couldn't we send it south? These lines already exist, all these other pieces. Why do we invest in something, as you said, that's already becoming a dying industry? And in some countries, they are wiping it right over. Are they, are they taking from, from front lines? Yes, these are your tax dollars that she is putting on the line right now. Is it the most advisable? I'm going to give you a different uh, spin on this one, but I'm going to let Joel kind of dig me out of the hole that I'm going to work towards here. For the last three years, this government has come in and they've been a progressive left-wing government supported by labor unions and all these other pieces that are strong to uphold the left-wing perspective. And we haven't done a good job in holding that line and keeping them at least center or at least center left. What we've done is allow them to shift to the right by, by, by citizens not reaching out, not getting involved in, in, in the activities like the one that we're at tonight. As we look around the room here, we got half the chairs full. Those arguments are being told to our government every day. You gotta get a pipeline, you gotta whatever. All these other pieces that we need to do, but it's not us saying it. It's corporate industry, flat tax. Corporate industry, it's not us. And so this has allowed them to be drawn to the right. And as you draw that government to the right, suddenly there's this big void. And that's where we're stuck right now. Is that we don't have the capacity anymore as labor, as social movements, to defend the left. And that government is starting to slide. Why? Well, because the elections are coming in 12 months. That's my opinion. I don't know if that answers your question. Not even close, probably. But I'll, I'll take that as a chance to all save here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> you don't you don't get to talk all the time. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna set aside my my environmental concerns about it for a moment because I, I do have deep environmental concerns about it uh, and talk about it just purely in terms of the public um, public investment question. Uh, we're talking about sinking billions of dollars into one piece of infrastructure. Um, Potentially without significant public oversight about how that money is used or anything like that, which concerns me for one, right? If, if we're investing, we need to save. Um, but also, uh, when I think about it in terms of relative scale, I think about, um, you know, a, a, a teacher's salary is $100,000 a year. Uh, I think about the fact that um, a new high school that we desperately need in this city is, is cost, the cost on that's about $79 million. And I think about the fact that we're being told that the, there's not the funds for that, right? And those, when I think about what a high school means or what a hospital means, or those things mean in terms of investment in our future and in terms of creating good jobs, right? Teaching jobs are good jobs. Uh, healthcare jobs are good jobs. 
They're, they're good, stable, public sector jobs. They create real employment. And we're talking about uh, investing money in a pipeline that's going to create, yes, potentially some jobs, not as many as people think in terms of permanent work. And so when we're just talking about this purely from an economic question, I have to say, like, what, what are we investing in our futures here? And what are we investing in our present here in terms of the lives of our children, the lives of our citizens who need health care, the lives of all those people? You know, setting aside my very deep environmental concerns, and I do have them, but just on the public investment piece, is this how we should be using our resources? Thank you both. And I think I would just add one more piece to that, and Mike started to talk about this a little bit, is, is um, I mean, I know how people in government feel right now. They feel, um, they feel like they have to get the pipeline built in order to get re-elected. I'm not convinced they're necessarily right, but that's how they feel right now. And I think for those of us who share uh, the environmental concerns and the economic concerns and the comparative sort of trade-off concerns with investing in that project instead of other things, um, I think it's up to those of us in civil society to shift how Albertans think about those issues. In, in some ways, actually, there are similarities to the issue we're talking about here today around the tax system. Is uh, our, our duty in civil society, where, where we aren't, I mean, some of us are, uh, some people are involved in political parties too, but out in civil society, when we're talking to our neighbors and coworkers and that sort of thing, it's our job to convince Albertans of, of these views. And so for, uh, so for folks who strongly believe that pipeline should be built, whether it's, uh, or should, should not be built, whether it's for environmental concerns or for, uh, for budgetary concerns, we have to have those conversations with everybody around us, and it, of course, has to go much further outside of this room. And so I think, much like the finance minister was throwing back to myself, and, and he said this to Ricardo Acuna too at the Parkland Institute, that if we want to have this conversation about taxes, we need to lead this conversation with Albertans and convince Albertans that this is the right way to go. I think the same is true with the pipeline and with, with climate change generally and on a, on a lot of other issues, pharmacare as well. We need to convince people that this is something they need to demand of their government. And uh, so that means there's a lot of work for us to do. And uh, you know, I think we did a lot of that groundwork on some issues leading up to the last election. Uh, I can speak for Public Interest Alberta. We had a campaign that pushed for corporate tax to be increased and pushed for scrapping the flat tax. And we were talking about our public services then. And we laid the groundwork for that and, and the government made those changes. And so uh, for these types of tough questions that seem like they're controversial out there in the world and maybe the politicians, even the ones that uh, we think are on our side, aren't moving the direction that we want, we need to lead those conversations with Albertans and, uh, and have Albertans have a groundswell of support for those issues um, so that uh, politicians feel like they have to um, follow our lead. And another thing that Ricardo, Ricardo's not here tonight, but I'm quoting him a, little, uh, a few times. Another thing that he likes to say is that politicians love to get in front of a parade. And uh, so they like to do popular things when they're already popular. So if we want them to get in front of the parade of uh, maybe it's not building the pipeline, maybe it's changing our tax system. We need to create the parade of Albertans that are demanding those things and you can be sure that a politician is going to jump right in front and lead, and, and lead that parade. But it's us that need to show the leadership. Thanks. Uh, that, those, those graphs and those numbers are absolutely amazing. And I don't think they persuade a lot of people. I think what persuades a lot of people is what's actually happening in their lives. Now you all know I have an obsession around elder care. In the last two years, I've moved from basically monitoring what's happening in our long-term care facilities, which are turned into places of last resort, to what's happening in home care, and what's happening with caregiver distress, they call it. I call it absolutely destroying the families and the people who stay home, leave their jobs, leave their communities to look after people for whom there is no place in the system. I'm looking at a home care system that doesn't have physiotherapists that can go out and provide any kind of rehabilitation for anything. I'm looking at a, a system that doesn't have social workers who can help people manage what they could salvage out of their lives and the lives of the people they're looking after. And I also find 
that the people who are devastated, literally, by this, don't want to talk about it because they think it's their fault. And I think we have to create a space in which the stories of these people should be talked about, should be demonstrated, because believe me, it could happen to any one of us. And I think that's a part that's missing in this discussion. And it's missing with the children. And it's missing particularly, which annoys me, with a government that won't talk about the problems. <coughs> that doesn't want to report the incident reports in which people in care facilities are damaged or killed by their fellow residents or the staff that don't want to talk about people who die without proper medical care, let alone comfort care. And I think the children who are left out of this system, or the children that are caring for elders who need it, or their parents who need it with this addiction or mental health problems or whatever, because there are child caregivers in our problems, and that's just disgusting. So what I would like to suggest is we find a way to make people understand these are the stories of real people and their neighbors and it could be them if we don't change how we see our public services. Thanks, Carol. Anybody want to comment on it? I mean, it, it did speak for itself too, but if anybody wants to respond. I'll give one piece on it if I can. If yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the story, and obviously you have a lived experience that, that we might share a little bit. Um, my dad's in the same kind of predicament as my And there's, there's an option for physiotherapy. There's an option for physiotherapy, my apologies. And it's out of my pocket. I could hire private people to come in and, and take care of it. And that's, that's where we shifted years ago, and they started creating these spaces within our, our, our Medicare plan and allowing for uh, deregulation of some of this stuff. You can get it, you just got to pay for it. Well, my dad lives on CPP, and uh, that covers his rent, and I take care of the rest. So that's that's not worth a hill of beans. And maybe there's an extra 20 bucks a month for him because they've added uh, OAS improvements. Well, that's 20 bucks a month. That's So I'll still buy him a cup of coffee when I go over there. You know, that, that's, how, that's how stuff works these days. And, and there was this promise when he was younger that if he bought into Pharmacare, or if he bought into Medicare, that he'd be taken care of. You know, if he bought into CPP, he'd be taken care of. Well, the reality is, none of that stuff has kept pace with what it actually cost today. And the deregulation of half of our industry has left us with, well, you can come into the hospital, I'll give you a prescription, I guess. Good luck filling it, because you've got to now decide between utilities and your medication. I had a question earlier, uh, we were talking about uh, people that require EpiPens. It's a hundred bucks. Kind of a life-saving piece, isn't it, if you need it? My dad's a diabetic. He's paying for his own medications, or the syringes, not the appliances that he needs. He's a cancer survivor. He needs pieces to keep him going. And these pieces come out of his pocket, not out of healthcare. If he didn't have them, he dies. This is where we truly are in healthcare. That's what we need to let people know. And I really like how you phrase it. You want us to tell that story. I just need someone to listen to it. Where's your baby? Sure, and then I'll pass it on down to Mark. I think so. Well, or do you want to do you want to talk? Or I can. I'm, I'm going to just talk for a minute about. Um, and this is not to do with my job. This is this is a personal experience. But my my mother died of cancer a few years ago, and um, she had brain tumor, and she went into hospice care. And um, well, we found out what happens is that when you go into hospice, you have a limited amount of time to die before they tell you you're out of time in hospice. And I am so, my mother lived in hospice for two years. And you're supposed to only get six months. And I am so deeply grateful for the social worker and the nursing staff and all of the people at that hospice who fought tooth and nail <coughs> for her heart to have the dignity and comfort of dying in a place where she was cared for. She was, we could not care for ourselves. We were, we were pretty young at the time, and this, especially when my brother was still a teenager, you know. We weren't able to do that, and, and that hospice care was so important for us, and it allowed us to have the time as a family to, to be around her to do that. But this is the system we're in where 
if you don't die fast enough, you don't get care anymore unless somebody, unless some caring social worker or nurse steps up and fights their hardest for you. And they fought like that for her, and I really appreciate it. But it shouldn't have to be that way. You should get the care you need at the end of your life. In social work, we call it personal problems, public issues. That's where the change has to occur. Um, and what happens very often is, as you said, people start to blame themselves. They think that they have done something wrong. They're undeserving. And we talk about the undeserving and deserving in, in Alberta. Like, if you work, you're deserving. But then if you work, but you only get minimum wage, you're not deserving anymore. So the, the stories need to be told, but what it is, is what, what do you get from telling your story? Um, and as Bridget says, who's listening? And it is to the politicians. I've had many a time when I couldn't, as a public servant, speak out, but our associations, the collectivity of social work can speak out, and that's where we, we move ahead in the social justice issue. But there's not enough people coming together to say, how do we get this writing campaign going? How do we get the message to? And you always put a story in, in your letter, a personal story of an experience that you've had. Um, and I think we, we know that we, we need to keep doing it as a collectivity. I think, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the people don't like to pay more taxes. But they might be willing to if they actually see that services are deteriorating. And uh, you know, my little exercise here with the budget. I mean, I'm in a very privileged position. I can sit in my nice, comfortable, warm office, and I have some computer and computers, and I have data that I can go to. Uh, but the you know, the, the interesting fact for me is that, you know, we, we, we hear here of all the problems that exist in the system already. And now we're looking ahead to what our social democratic government plans for the future. And we're looking six years down the road. And we're looking at getting a 15% cut in services. Now, that's not advertised in the budget, it's not in the media releases, it's not in the news. You know, the thing that's in the news is that, oh, the nominal spending of the government is going up every year. Yeah, the nominal spending is going up every year, but the real services are still being cut. And that was something that I didn't know when I came, approached that, that data, and I don't think anyone here projected that the, uh, you know, six years in the future, we would be getting a cut that would perhaps take us to where we were in the climb years. Uh, I, th I think that, that this government, and, and I shouldn't say just this government, because this is a problem that has been going on for many years, and you can go back at least a decade, and the current government has only had to suffer for the last three, in during particularly difficult times. But we saw the PCs before, they maintained spending, yes, but they did it by cutting back or reducing their, their bank account. And that didn't appear so bad as when you actually have to go out in the market and borrow. But I think it's an opportunity lost by this government in the sense that here was a dramatic change in revenues and you could possibly go out to the public and explain what was happening to the fiscal system in the province and the need for change. But everybody, the NDP, the, the Conservatives, the United Conservatives, the PCs, all of us, the, the whole works, the Alberta Party, nobody wants to face the facts because they're afraid that, you know, you talk about increasing taxes, that's a terrible thing to, to have to carry to the public. And I think what the plan is, or what all the plan is, is to squeeze the public until they beg for more taxes. You know, until you suffer, your children suffer, your grandchildren suffer, 
you can see the effects and they have negative effects upon us and many of us individually, then maybe we will be prepared to pay more taxes. Or alternatively, we just hope that the resource revenues really increase dramatically and you know everything's fine and we're back on the roller coaster again. But uh, I, I'm afraid, in, in my view, and and I can speak for a lot of economists. I mean, economists have been arguing for a long time that this natural resource revenue uh, up and down is not the way to finance the public sector. But uh, we come with different views as to how to solve that problem. But uh, the thing is, is that it's not a sensible system, and we suffer from it when the resource revenues go down. But here is an opportunity, and in my view, it was an opportunity lost. Thanks, Paul. Yvonne, did you ever hear that before? Yeah, um, Mel kind of summed up what, what I was generally thinking, that, that we heard how awful it is right now in senior care, in the schools, in the hospitals. And maybe what we have to do is somehow represent to the general public what that 20% drop could mean. Is it blow up four hospitals? Is it a hospital and a school? Is it, like, like maybe that's what we, like the numbers show for themselves that it's crazy. We can't keep going this way. We have to do something about our revenue. But till they see, till the general public sees, like has been said here, how it personally affects them. And one of the things I liked about PS Alberta could um, uh, campaign that they had is they actually tied it to with this much money we could, and, and they showed how much this amount of money could could get you. I don't know. I don't know if that's the way, but. I was part of that mid-90s smash, and I almost started crying when you talk, because you brought me right back there. The amount of healthcare staff that went on stress leave because of mental anguish and everything, um, how many good doctors and nurses that we lost out of not just Alberta, but out of Canada, we were losing them by droves. And if the public understood, if they think wait times are bad now, try getting rid of, you know, a, a, a two-thirds of love, which is what we did back in the 90s. I <coughs> have to be a lot tech, so I can uh, very, very <laughs> much attest for that. It just blows my mind. 20%. It's very scary, but uh, nobody really pays attention until it affects them. There's those stories. That's, those stories are impactful. Totally personal stories. But until we tie that in with what, this is what you can lose. And if you pay this much of us an HST, you don't have to worry about that. I don't know. That's just my thoughts. I think you're absolutely right. I just, I'm just going to say one thing with that, which is that um, I agree that it's going to be worse when we get back to those spending levels because a lot of our systems haven't recovered from last time, right? Like a lot, a lot of the, the infrastructure problems, a lot of that stuff. Like when we, we haven't, we haven't recovered from then. I mean, I. I'm, I'm where I am now as a trustee because I was a high school student then, and I remember what happened, and it made me mad, and I'm still mad. <laughs> I paid for my daughter to go for kindergarten, too. Yeah, I'm 40 years old, I'm still mad about it, so um, I'm probably going to stay mad. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, so anyways, so we're, we're still paying that back, right? That's when I talk about that debt being hidden away, hidden away in our public services. It is. It's still hiding there, right? It didn't get paid off. It just got swept under the rug. I want a bumper sticker, Joel. I love to pay taxes. Raise my taxes? Raise my taxes. Raise my taxes, save my parents. Raise my kids.
Yeah. So go to Paul. Paul and then over to Larry. Yeah, Mel, I really appreciated your presentation. It was a real eye-opener for me because I'm from British Columbia, so born and raised there. And when you said that if uh, Albertans were paying the same rate of taxes, we wouldn't have a, uh, a problem here with, uh, with revenue. And uh, how many people in Alberta actually uh, maybe think we pay as much taxes or the same rate as uh, BC? Uh, I, I really think there's a lot of ignorance on this and, and misinformation. We're victims of the corporatocracy who are out there to, to make sure that uh, they convince us that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, we, we, we don't want to uh, be uh, uh, really uh, uh, spending that kind of uh, money on uh, social programs and so on. And uh, I, I'm a little bit confused about all this because I, I, I can't see where ordinary people who, who have families and raise children can that they are so ignorant that they really don't know what's best for them. Uh, so we need to get at least tell them and let them decide for themselves. I don't think they know. And I think this is a problem and what you're doing is very necessary. Thank you. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right in the sense that people don't want or don't know, but also they don't want to know. I mean, if you present them with the facts, uh, you get a, you know, uh, I don't believe it, or we can we can do this by you know becoming more efficient, all that, all those yeah. kind of stories. But and I, I have a point. Uh, the, the tremendous increase in real estate prices. When you go to buy, when someone goes to buy a, a, a piece of real estate. Now, if they were paying more in taxes, the bank, the banker would then say, "Oh, you can only afford this much of a house, so maybe we wouldn't have quite the increase in real estate prices, and we would have been paid more in taxes, and we would have been a whole lot better off." Because you know how it is when when you go to a bank, the banker is trying to figure out how to uh, maximize the profit off, and we got this tremendous. You know, I, I really think that if we just had our priorities right, uh, we we would really a whole lot better off. I'm not an economist, but uh, <laughs> well, I'm trying well, to think uh, in a practical way. Getting our priorities right is outside my economics. <laughs> you can hold on to it. Larry will make a comment and then say, yep. Yeah. And then we might have time for one more and then we'll have to wrap up and we can still stay in chat for a few minutes after. Um, I find this very encouraging. Uh, I, the five of you at the front it was so helpful and so insightful. Like, I thought I had a good grasp of this, but um, it's a lot richer after tonight. And some of the observations uh, from the audience as well. Um, I think uh, we need to talk about what we need to do. You know, I think we've analyzed the problem quite well, and we need to talk about what we need to do. And I think Mike analyzed it really well. We've got these great people in government. These are first-rate, smart, kind people who somehow are going to end up relying on hoping more resource revenue is going to help. And they're headed towards, in 2023, 20, 24, they're heading towards cutting public services by 15%. I mean, think about it. And then with the other party, they're telling us up front, you know, um, we're looking at 20% with them. And they'll balance the budget. Now, by the way, they'll balance the budget by cutting. By about 20%. So if we look at where this is heading, if the NDP get back in and continue on this course, we, we, we still lose in, in the same way. I mean, that, that, that's clearly where this is heading from good, well-intentioned people. So then the question becomes, what is it that, that we do about it? Um, it seems to me, if we look at health sciences workers, where there are 25,000 now, and if there is a 20% cut, let's say it's the worst situation, and the way it's headed right now, these, these folks can win. And so there's gonna be 20,000 
health sciences workers for a growing population. Um, instead of 8,000 um, social workers, we're probably going to have about 8,400. Uh, there are 35,000 teachers, and we're probably going to be at about 28,000. Uh, there are 95,000 AUPE members, and so we could easily be looking at a loss of 17,000 of those. I, this, this is not science fiction, right? This is where this stuff is headed. And what will solve it, quite simply, is a 5% sales tax. Quite, that, that's where this is going. That's what you've seen here tonight. Probably 5%. Like, you could burn up the, um, the Heritage Fund in two years of deficit, but if you had a 5% sales tax, so uh, the, the nice thing is, A, we're right about this, and B, there's a much better answer. And C, this same answer is already in place in every other province. The lowest HST is 6%. So this is not impossible stuff. So then the question is, what, what do we do? And, and I, I like the people's stories, but, but that's a piece of the puzzle, but it's not going to do it and by, on its own, but it is an important piece of the puzzle. I thought what Yvonne said was, crucial if the public understood. And in fact, this is not a stupid population. I mean, they may not, they may be ignorant, but they're not stupid. And so the question is, where do you get to where Yvonne, where Yvonne's question takes us, if the public understood. And it seems to me we can't count on Mike and the leadership in each organization to do this themselves. And so I guess, to me, the question that I would raise is, what would it take to get a big, big number of 25,000 health sciences workers engaged and mobilized? What would it take to get more than half of the 8,000 health uh, uh, of social workers engaged and mobilized? Because it seems to me that's where our strength is, going back to Yvonne's question. That's where our strength is. And if, I, I, my gut instinct after many, many years of doing this is, if we engage, because these are the people who are going to lose their jobs. And not only that, they're the people who are going to suffer most by watching their services not be available to these people, right? You could survive losing your job, but when you have to live with what you know it's like in those classrooms and in those hospitals, and, right? So then, it, it seems to me the direction is, the, 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 the key strategy is probably the extent to which the big organizations can engage and mobilize their members in carrying the message forward. And then these people hear from it. But right now, as Mike said, they're hearing from the right wing, and the right wing are saying, don't raise taxes, and we gotta, we gotta build that pipeline so there'll be more money. So where will we be? We will be relying on resource revenues until the next problem. So I guess in any reaction to that, whether you know, in, in terms of the strategy, and by the way, I quite accept Carol's strategy of making the public understand by, by seeing people's stories and these narratives, absolutely crucial. But what about that as the overall strategy? And I look forward to a reaction to that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, um, I, think, I think Yvonne drew our attention to something really important, which is when we talk about what's possible. Because I think we, we, we're really good often at sort of these these diagnostic exercises where we talk about what our problems are, and I think that's important. Right? I think it's important for people to know what the challenges are, but I think we also need to talk to people about what is possible if we do this. Because, like, for me, the base level bare minimum is that children get back to the level of, of with the quality of education that I had as a kid growing up in this province in the eighties, right? Like I, you know. We had a school nurse, we had counselors, we, we had a teacher librarian, you know, I loved my teacher librarian, she helped me, she, I was a nerdy kid and she would always save whatever new books came in so that I could get a chance to read them because I read everything in the school. And you know, like, it, it, those things were wonderful and kids don't have that opportunity today. So to me, that's the bare minimum. But I also want to start talking to people about imagining what we could do. Right? What, what would be possible for us? Because I think that's really important. It's important to tell people what the challenges are, but I think it's also to say, you know, we have a choice of something else in this. You know, if we choose to make this investment, and we're all going to make this investment for ourselves in, in our present and in our future to, to have a, you know, have an EA in your kid's school when they need it, have a school new, 
I'm, I'm a big dreamer. I have a dream of a universal school nutrition program. But um, to have access to early education for every child, right? Not just kids who are pop funded, but every kid to be able to have that option. So we stop having a two-tiered early education system. You know, I'm, I'm a big dreamer. I, I like to think about talking to people. Like, this isn't just a choice of, you know, you pay this so that you don't have a bad step. Like, what could we have? What could we build for ourselves in this province? What, what could we create? And I think, I think we have to talk about the scary stuff. I think, I think we, we get too scared of this, you know, we say, oh, we don't want to use the politics of fear, but I think it's important that people know what the fear is, but I think it's also important that we talk to people about the hope for something better. And so I think it's really important, Larry, that we have this conversation about a sales tax, that we talk about how we make these investments, what's the best way to do it, how do we do it, and what can we get if we took that risk? What, what can we do for ourselves in this province? And you, Alberta, said. Mm -hmm. For those who didn't hear it, Yvonne said, a new Alberta advantage. I'm going to go back in time for a second. Let's see if we can uh, kind of connect two dots that I've been working on here as Larry was talking. Uh, Ralph Bucks. Anybody remember Ralph Bucks? Yeah. A few nods there. For the, for the gentleman from British Columbia, our wonderful premier was cutting checks to everybody. An 18 year old kid fresh out of high school got a check for, I think, 400 bucks. Well, let me I tell was, you what I did I with that one, okay? If I had connected the dot and realized that that check in my hand, was the end of my dad and my mom's career. Maybe I wouldn't have spent it inappropriately. Yes. When Larry was doing his little exercise on what this 20% means to my membership, yeah, it's 5,000 members unemployed. After he was done kind of calling out other unions and identifying how many people were talking about here, we hit well over 100,000 people just lost their jobs with the stroke of a 20% reduction in funding. The Heritage Trust Fund, won't cover six months of keeping the lights on in the school. So, so burning that thing off isn't going to get us out of this issue. I wasn't suggesting that. No, 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 no. I, I, and that's the problem is that, is that I have sat here going, well, we have money. How about, what, what can we do with this money? Well, our provincial budget is sitting at $40 billion. So that, that doesn't, you know, maybe it's higher than that. I don't know what the summary You know, uh, this is a difficult conversation. I was telling my, my coworker here, Vaughn, that uh, I just came from my accountant on the way over here. Okay, so Joel says, Mike, come and speak on tax increases, and I picked up my stuff from the uh, accountant. I am one unhappy cat today, because I've got to find a few bucks to pay my account. But it's the reality. What my members have a hard time connecting is that a 5% sales tax saves 100,000 jobs in this province, and guess what they do every day with their money? They spend it in this province, they pay taxes in this province, and that cycle just keeps growing. The intent of this other government that's looking to get in here is to privatize. They're going to privatize you, me, and everybody else that works in my line of work. I'm sure you've looked and evaluated how they'll privatize within education. And when you privatize a company, like the guys that clean our highways today, there's one specific piece that they need, and that's profit. When we had our liquor stores, there was profit being made there, but it was reinvested in this province. Our highways today are being cleaned by the same guys that were driving those trucks 20 years ago. But there's no profit coming back to Albertans. It's profit going to a company that is now, oh, I don't know, debunked and bankrupt in, in the UK. That's where our tax dollars were going. So there needs to be some bigger conversations. These are difficult conversations. And my own members don't connect the dots. And that's my job heading forward. Would it help if all your people send an open letter to your members, <coughs> giving them some of this? Giving some of this information, could you do that? Is that possible? To send an open letter to your members, giving them some of the stuff we've heard tonight. I think you guys are in positions to spread this message, and a lot of us aren't. I'm gonna, I'm, uh, I don't have my first. In this uh, I'll, I'll give you a perspective from, from my membership. Um, when we've taken a stance in the past, a political stance, those that are understanding of what we're saying, uh, don't email me. Those that are not understanding of what we are saying absolutely have something to say about it. So when you're dealing with a politician, an elected person in these positions, and I get 150 emails back saying, don't you dare tell me how to vote. Knowing full no, well, no, 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 I said, yeah, let's, let, let's go full, let, let's have this. This is, this is, again, these are the tough conversations. How do you get me to do that? Because the impact of me doing that is I'm going to get yelled at again. I'm willing to take the fight. It's only 150 members, some would say. 
But these are, these are some tough conversations that have to be had over the fences on the front streets with our members every day. Because if we find ourselves in a 15% reduction in healthcare services or a 20% reduction in healthcare services, that means no more people are going to be entering our work world. And when I'm ready to use them, they're not going to be there for me. That's what we're facing, absolutely, right now. Anybody else want to? I, say, I, don't, I don't have members to send letters to, but what I do do is every time I go to a school council and somebody says, why don't I have an EA in my child's classroom, then we have a conversation about education funding. I mean, I, I have these conversations all the time, right? And I also try to assure people, every single teacher, every single EA, every single principal that's out there is going to do their utmost to make sure the kids are still getting a good education. And the hard work that those people are doing is protecting people in some ways from knowing how how thin things have gotten, right? Because they will, they'll stay for an extra two or three hours after school to try to make up and try to make things happen. And, and I'm sure healthcare workers are the same way. But that's my job, right? I don't have a membership that I can send letters to, but I can have really frank conversations. And in some ways, really frank, as an elected person, a public official, I can have some really frank conversations in those settings that uh, teachers and, and social workers and those things, those people sometimes can't because they can't be political in the same way when they're on the job, right? That's fine. That's it. Sylvia and Sylvia will have to be our last uh, comment or question. And Sorry to be a bit of a downer, but in my experience with family, friends, and especially rural Alberta, anybody who implements a sales tax loses the next election. Can we live with Jason Kenny? <laughs> Um, and uh, I, I didn't go over this at the beginning, but what we're hoping to do through this campaign is actually to influence the conversation in the next election. We don't expect the current government to implement a sales tax between now and election day. I mean, the election's only a year away anyway, but if we don't start these conversations now, then it'll never happen. And so we need to start now, we need to be out in front of things, and we need to set the groundwork for, uh, for a time when uh, when a government can take some action on this and make it happen. And we, what I said earlier was we need to create the demand among Albertans that we solve this problem. And, and that requires creating an, a broad understanding of what the problem is. We need the government to join us in helping to educate Albertans about the problem. And I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, but I think as we, as we get started and, and you know, if, if we're able to get this kind of campaign and, and other similar campaigns out to enough people, then I think we'll see government start to slowly come along. And governments take a while to turn around, but if, if we don't start it now, then we're never going to get there. And I think, you know, I, I'm from Lloydminster, one of the most conservative places in the province, I would say. Um, and when I go back and talk to my family and the people in the church that I grew up in, it's very, very conservative. Um, if you put everything on the table in, in a really frank way, you know, they might not agree right away, but if, if you can start to educate them and talk to them about these, these trade-offs, you know, you either, either we're going to pay more taxes or you're, we're going to see your child's education cut, we're going to see um, wait times get even worse in health care and wait times for seniors' care beds and talk to them about the implications and those things work uh, and I have those conversations with very, very conservative people and like I said, I, I maybe can't get them pounding on the doors of the legislature to demand a sales tax. We're not there yet. Um, but they understand, I think Larry said, you know, they're, they're smart people in this province. So they might not have all the facts yet. And that's what we're trying to uh, make happen. And so um, that's a good segue into what I think our calls to action are for tonight. For those of us in this room is... Uh, we, of course, want you to take what you've learned here outside of this room, uh, out there into your communities, whatever your communities may be. Maybe it's your community league or organizations you're involved in or just your family and your friends. Um, but we really want everybody to go on to that Revenue Reno website, revenuereno.ca, and fill out that form to send a message to your MLA because they need to hear you. And it's easy. It takes about two minutes or so. You fill in. It's one of those ones you fill in your name, your email address, your postal code. Your MLA will pop up. There's a form message there that you can use. You can also edit it if, if uh, you want and add some of your own thoughts and click send and, uh, and try to encourage a few others to do that. Uh, also, I mentioned these leaflets at the beginning and I would love it if every person, and not everybody can use the same amount. I know that not everybody's able to get rid of 50 or 100 of these, but however many you think you can use, we've got them at the table over there. 
And, uh, and if you decide a week from now you want more, contact our office and we will get them to you. We'll drive them over to you or ship them to you or you can come pick them up at our office. Uh, and, you know, I'll be touring the province with these two and getting them out to lots of other places. And there's, and, pl there's, and there's plenty more in the box under the table, so don't yeah, be Yeah, we have a, a ton of them here and more in boxes at the office. And, uh, and host an event or a conversation. So the kind of conversation we had here tonight, you know, I might not be able to bring this whole crew with me, but if you've got an organization, I've spoken to John and Carol's uh, organization of seniors uh, already a few weeks ago, but if there's somewhere where I can come and talk about this campaign and we can show the videos and, you know, I'm available to do this stuff, that's what we're here for. Uh, so let me know if there's somewhere I can be and I can help you to have these conversations. Maybe it's in the living room uh, and that would work too. Um, I also want to say that um, Mike's organization, uh, organization HSAA, is doing something about this too. In addition to being here tonight, they're one of the organizations that helped to pay for this campaign and make it happen. And it wouldn't happen with organiza without organizations like HSAA, the Alberta Teachers Association, AUPE, the United Nurses of Alberta, the Transit Workers here in Edmonton. Those organizations all helped to make this campaign happen, to produce this video and the website and the materials and rent the venue here tonight. And so those organizations are making an investment and I think we can all do more and we all want to find ways to do more. Um, but we're, we're starting with this and I think we're off to a good start. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to say was um, that Public Interest Alberta does of course count on your support. And we do have membership forms for I think a lot of folks in the room here tonight are members already, but if you're not, um, then we encourage you to buy a membership of Public Interest Alberta. You'll get this uh, publication of the Advocate that we send out three times a year with some great articles and updates. Um, and you'll also be investing in a, a way of us getting the word out on this issue and so many more uh, uh, other important issues as well and help us to continue our work. Um, so if you're interested in that and you can uh, contribute a little bit or a little bit more than you are already, then uh, you can find those forms on our table too.